Hey, folks. Hello. All right, that should be my audio test. Can everybody hear me okay? At least someone. Thank you, Mickey. Myel, could you say something uh, so that I can hear you? Good afternoon. It works. Nice. All right, we'll uh, just give uh, another minute or two for, for folks to join in. Um, thank you, uh, everybody, uh, for, for arriving on time. Okay, well, uh, to to respect uh, everybody who had a chance to uh, arrive on time, we'll uh, we'll get started. Um, this is exciting for me. I, I see some folks uh, in the room, the virtual room. Uh, I haven't had a chance to catch up with in a while, uh, so I, I'm uh, getting all sorts of excited for for this discussion. Um, uh, please forgive me if uh, your expectation of the next couple hours is that I'd give you all the answers for uh, hemp harvest and processing. Um, that is not our goal for today. Uh, in, in fact, um, more so uh, the opportunity to uh, kind of hear from folks uh, in the space, uh, what their experience has been. Um, get a kind of overview of of my experience uh, going through this uh, in Florida and and some other uh, national level uh, collaborations. Um, and so, uh, you know, with that, uh, I, I'm sort of uh, welcoming uh, folks to participate at, at certain instances. And, um, uh, you know, with, with all that uh, participation and whatnot, um, I uh, would like to uh, go through a, a couple preliminary steps uh, just to give uh, folks uh, a chance to uh, participate. Um, this one is for the, the chat. Um, so uh, you get a couple practices uh, using this virtual uh, Zoom system. Um, so in the chat, uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself, uh, particularly if you uh, plan on contributing some knowledge here, uh, write your uh, these sorts of pieces of information, you know, your name, uh, who you're representing. If you'd like people to reach out to you as after uh, this discussion, you can give them a way to do that. Um, and then uh, kind of a... 
a question for the group to uh, get the juices flowing uh, in a, a couple of in a phrase or a sentence. Uh, how do you decide uh, when to harvest your hemp? Okay, I can see this is going to be quite the lively crowd. Oh, Eric, thank you. You you uh, you got a whole uh, paragraph here. That's great. Oh, I, Eric's AI assistant. All right, I got excited for the paragraph. That's right, Mickey, you're going to have a tail wagging through your face every now and again. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, folks. Uh, nice uh, chance to uh, catch up. Uh, the chat is is open. Um, so uh, throughout the meeting, if you have some questions, you're, you're welcome to drop them in there. Um, uh, there's also ways to uh, communicate with others on the call, uh, kind of private message uh, style. So uh, certainly uh, allowable and, and encouraged to uh, have constant uh, conversations on the side. Um, one other thing, uh, Yael, uh, can you just indicate for me, uh, you might be available to uh, moderate the questions in the chat? Sure, I can assist with that. Great, thank you. So if you see something, just jump in and, and let me know. All right, uh, so the next one, uh, now that we've had our uh, information up in the chat window, another way uh, that you might help someone find you uh, during the discussion um, is to rename yourself um, on the uh, Zoom. Let's see, can I do it with all these windows that I have open? Let's see, I can by going to participants and then selecting mine and renaming. So just so that you can see that I can do it on the fly. I'm now UF Hemp uh, Zachary Brim. So uh, if you folks uh, have uh, a, a FDAX uh, representation or a company you'd rather be known for, or hey, I have uh, fiber material, please buy it. Or I, you know, I need flower material to process it. Another a way to get us all um, on the same page, trying to make a, as much of interaction out of this virtual thing as we can. Um, and I took out my note to remind myself to record. So I actually, have we started recording? Uh -oh, we are already recording, automated. Okay, so um, before I get started, as I remind myself of all of these things, um, I am Zach Brim. UFIFIS uh, Tropical Research and Education Center uh, Agronomy Department. Uh, we are recording, um, so please uh, be aware uh, that uh, that is an aspect of, of, of this, this meeting. I also like to take a moment, uh, as I've uh, been kind of uh, walking around in circles with my introduction, uh, that this is uh, meant to instill some interaction. We certainly encourage that. Uh, we'd like for that to be... Um, uh, respectful and thoughtful uh, opinions are welcome uh, as uh, long as you're able to provide uh, kind of uh, thoughtful response uh, response and context for for where that opinion comes from. So uh, with that, uh, we will continue and I'm going to do this here. All right. So the first uh, bit of the discussion uh, for folks that are in uh, the industry well and, and truly, uh, this should be a uh, overview uh, of information. Uh, and uh, otherwise, uh, this is a really critical uh, piece of the puzzle for uh, developing your harvest time and your compliance testing. I'm grateful to see uh, many from uh, FDAX uh, joining us today. They can keep me honest, uh, make sure that I'm uh, speaking the truth uh, related to this. Our, our pri previous 
uh, discussions have been about farm planning and markets, uh, a little bit about planting and nutrient management. Uh, last uh, meeting was about pests and diseases. And so this really uh, leads up through all of that into uh, what happens if you have a viable crop to harvest? How do you decide when to harvest? And perhaps more importantly, how do you ensure uh, that you're doing so uh, in compliance uh, with your uh, permit? So this first part of the discussion, I'm going to lump the hemp crops together, kind of an uh, overview of the plant and its physiology, a description of the regulatory framework uh, for the crop. Uh, but uh, what I would also like to do um, is, is break down those crops, and, and we do that uh, later on. So I am continuously thinking about hemp as, as really three primary cropping systems. Uh, with the cartoons here, uh, you see that we have the uh, fiber crop, uh, the grain uh, crop, and, and the flower crop, uh, and, and we'll break those down. But uh, really, as you think about the timing for your crop, uh, it is going to be impacted by the crop type that you are, are uh, producing. So just to make sure that I clarify that uh, at the beginning, Now, hemp is a primarily photoperiod sensitive plant. It's also dioecious, so there are male and female flowers uh, that are cued by the shortening uh, length of days, and, and more specifically, the phytochrome that we understand the plant to be uh, gathering uh, the signals uh, through is calculating in some ways uh, from the perspective of a plant, uh, the length of nights. And, and so this is uh, one of my favorite uh, shots uh, out, of, out of UF hemp. Uh, this is a variety trial that we planted in 2019. In the background is genetics from South China, Southern latitudes that share our own here in Florida. And in the foreground is Northern European genetics. And what you can see is that there's a whole bunch of flowers, both males and females uh, in the foreground, those European genetics, while the genetics in the back, those Southern Chinese are holding on to uh, their vegetative growth. And, and so depending on your crop type, depending on your exact latitude in Florida, the length of your day and those sort of seasonal patterns are going to greatly affect the timing of flowering and what uh, follows in terms of crop maturity. Uh, so we did this uh, study in uh, both a controlled environment and then uh, later on in the uh, outdoor uh, environment. And this is just a selection of those varieties uh, that we looked at. And what you can see are sort of three groups here. Uh, this group is the uh, northern uh, or extreme southern uh, genetics. Uh, and uh, those are flowering uh, in relation to uh, longer um, periods of light. So as those days uh, get uh, shorter, uh, they don't have to get as short in order for those uh, genetics. So just as a reference, this is about 14 hours. The longest day where I am in Homestead is about 13 hours and 45 minutes. So these genetics uh, in our uh, first variety trials um, has uh, the habit of flowering uh, immediately following its juvenile period, which uh, in Homestead we're seeing is something along the lines of two weeks or three weeks. So way too soon. Uh, these genetics kind of hang on uh, through uh, a bit of the summer uh, and uh, seem to give us a chance to put on some uh, productive growth. Uh, these last two on the bottom, uh, these are the genetics uh, from southern China, and, and you see them holding on uh, nearly to 12 hours. Uh, so in a controlled study, we can change the lights, and then we can calculate uh, how long it takes to flower following uh, the changing in lights. Uh, but uh, in the field, uh, we have to sort of make the observations uh, 
following uh, the change in physiology. Um, and so recently, uh, we've decided as a, a research group, uh, perhaps uh, we can encourage the industry as well, uh, to begin taking flowering uh, day uh, in the field as uh, terminal flowering. So you might have seen a hemp uh, plant that flowers across uh, the uh, the whole uh, plant uh, from the uh, base of the plant uh, where the flowering starts to the uh, plant terminus. Um, and so this plant terminus is uh, the, the period of flowering observed by this graphic here on the right. And so this was an early study uh, as well that we did. Uh, so two weeks after uh, terminal flowering, that's sort of what this uh, x-axis uh, is considering here. Uh, we're seeing these crops uh, from this study uh, going uh, above the compliance threshold, 0.3% uh, delta 9 uh, THC uh, within three to four weeks. So it's uh, really critical uh, to be watching your plants, uh, to be understanding how the compliance testing uh, relates to the plant development. And so uh, that's a, a major thing to consider. Uh, an interesting feature of cannabis uh, and uh, the development of cannabinoids is that there tends to be a higher concentration of cannabinoids at the uh, terminal end and uh, the apical meristem, that growing point, and, and also on the laterals uh, with uh, the uh, less cannabinoid development uh, in the bottom. Uh, just moving over to the left, uh, this picture, uh, another uh, point to make in clarification uh, is that the uh, compliance testing, uh, what is being sent to FDAX uh, to approve a harvest uh, for hemp it is just the uh, first uh, few centimeters, uh, eight to 10 centimeters off the top where the highest concentration of cannabinoids are going to be. Uh, whereas uh, if you might be selling a, a flower crop for, for biomass, then uh, that test off the top uh, is likely going to be higher than a uh, composite sample of your total biomass. Uh, so just uh, revisiting uh, the uh, hemp crops that I mentioned before and the length of day that we might expect these crops to go uh, if they match our latitude and, and, and they go on to a full uh, productive life cycle. Uh, the fiber uh, crop tends to be about 80 to 100 days. Um, this is terminated uh, at the first uh, flowering first uh, male flowering uh, in, in, in many cases, most cases though, uh, some uh, fiber uh, growers are waiting till the first female flowering. Uh, the point being that once flowers do develop, there's kind of a transition in the fiber quality. Uh, and so an earlier fiber harvest, uh, if you have a productive load, uh, is probably a better idea for, for crop quality. The uh, grain uh, requires that uh, 80, 60 to 80 days uh, to put on uh, flowers, uh, and then another uh, 30 to 60 days for seed development. Uh, an interesting feature, I mentioned dioecious, that means that there's males and females out in the field, and so you need an overlap in the male flowering uh, to pollinate the female flowers to uh, put on seeds. So uh, that takes uh, a full uh, three months or so. Now the flower, there's a couple different flowering types, uh, day neutral and uh, photoperiod sensitive varieties. So those day neutral, those are going to develop uh, based on, on temperature uh, primarily. Uh, and some of those crops will uh, turn over quickly, maybe 45 days. Uh, if it's a large uh, photo, photo period sensitive crop and you give it a long vegetative cycle, uh, it might take 100 uh, days in order to get to flower. So as I hinted at earlier, as those crops are developing, you also want to be very uh, conscious of the cannabinoids that are developing in those crops. Uh, there are several uh, testing labs uh, in the state, and, and those labs will contract with farmers uh, in order to develop their uh, laboratory uh, standards and, and field samples and, and whatnot. 
Uh, now, at least one sample is required for compliance testing. And so uh, that uh, compliance test uh, needs to be no earlier than 30 days prior to harvest. Uh, and so uh, I'm encouraging farmers to take tests uh, throughout their season, uh, not on this compliance test, but just uh, between them and their, their testing lab, uh, so that you have a good sense of how your plants are, are developing. You set up your harvest date and you draw back the calendar 30 days. Uh, within that 30 day window, uh, you have to take a, a sample uh, that is uh, specifically aligned uh, with the uh, compliance expectations. Uh, and so that goes along with this date. Uh, it goes along with a form uh, that I believe the uh, most of the testing uh, laboratories are helping folks with. You have to identify a, a quote unquote lot of hemp. And so that is a, a single variety and a contiguous area uh, of hemp. And then based on that lot will depend on uh, how many uh, cuttings you're taking uh, from the field. As I mentioned, there's going to be variability within the plant and between plants uh, for this compliance testing. So uh, less than an acre uh, for one uh, clipping uh, that could uh, really um, impact the uh, sample results uh, that you're getting. And, and so um, uh, perhaps uh, having a, a few more clippings as an agreement with your, your testing lab, or uh, there's also um, some opportunities to uh, do a retest um, if uh, compliance uh, is uh, at risk. Uh, just to mention that uh, there is some uh, opportunity um, to uh, do some uh, follow-up testing or remediation uh, with the state uh, in order to uh, ensure that you are meeting those compliance. Okay. Um, let me let me pause for a second. Let me see if anybody from the group uh, who's on the call uh, has uh, sort of questions about this uh, harvest timing or uh, compliance uh, for for uh, FDAX uh, approval for for harvest. Uh, before I get into the specific crops, uh, let me just uh, take a moment to. Um, okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Casuso has uh, let a. Um, uh, note here uh, that that includes a link to the approved uh, labs, and so there are currently two uh, in the state of Florida uh, that would be available to uh, meet this uh, compliance uh, requirement. And I, I know Nicole's fact checked me previously in, in other meetings. So uh, if I did say something uh, incorrect, I'm, I'm sure she would have uh, made sure to make that clarification. This is uh, knowledge for everybody already has. Uh, what's the uh, what's the discussion that's left? Anything? I'll, I'll count to 10 in my head. Okay, and I don't see any hands raised or, or waving emphatically. So we'll move on. Oh, okay, Steve uh, has shared a uh, an opinion here. Uh, laboratory tests and uh, labs available to do this uh, are, are limited. Uh, definitely can use some more. All right. Um, so fiber seed and, and flower. Uh, those are the three crop types. Uh, so uh, with the rest of the meeting today, uh, just sort of uh, walking through uh, the discussion of how we as a research team and what I've seen from the uh, industry, how these folks are going to uh, determine harvest timing, uh, kind of what uh, process or procedure uh, is necessary to go through that harvest. Uh, hopefully we have a, hear, a chance to hear from some folks on the call uh, about their experience uh, along the way. Um, and, and the burning question for me uh, is what do we do with all of this material? 
I think that is a major uh, shortcoming for Florida's hemp industry at this point, uh, kind of uh, having the capacity for processing and, and the processing that drives the markets uh, is something that's been really uh, missing from, from my observations around the state. So um, in, in that way, this discussion uh, is going to be uh, a bit limited, uh, a bit um, uh you know, uh, as a, a holding pattern, waiting on those aspects. But uh, again, maybe we'll get some some useful information. Okay, so forgive me. I'm sure you've all uh, recognized that the picture on the left is uh, not cannabis. Um, that is a sun hep uh, crop that uh, we've harvested uh, recently uh, with our new sickle bar mower. But I was excited to have a, a chance to get the picture uh, with the sickle bar mower. So I, I wanted to include that there. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, sun hemp, uh, crotillaria juncea, not at all related to, uh, industrial hemp, uh, cannabis sativa, um, timing. Uh, so the timing of a fiber crop, uh, is a couple, uh, different ways to think about it. Uh, so I mentioned previously, uh, that the flowering, uh, can cue a transition from vegetative to reproductive growth, and that affects the overall, uh, quality of the fibers. And now for a fiber crop, a farmer has uh, kind of two options for what they're trying to maximize uh, with their, their effort. Uh, the external fibers are bast fibers. Those are the high tensile strength, long fibers um, and that you can see kind of separating uh, from uh, the stem uh, in, in this picture. The internal fibers of uh, the herd, uh, those are the short fibers, uh, more kind of insulation, construction uh, materials uh, sort of thing. So what's interesting as an agronomist uh, considering this uh, fiber crop is the ratio of surface area to volume. So BAST uh, tends to occur uh, in uh, the external uh, areas. And so to have a high quality BAST production, you want very narrow diameter plants and very tall plants. So as your plants get older, if the spacing and the density uh, isn't keeping those plants nice and, and pencil sized, uh, then those plants are going to start uh, putting on diameter, affecting uh, your ability to pull off uh, bast from that. So that's another feature of the crop uh, that you want to consider uh, when you're putting out your fields uh, and when you're planning on harvesting. Uh, now, the herd, uh, you can get side, kind of your bulky uh, tree-sized uh, plants. Uh, many of the varieties uh, will have a hollow core, a hollow stem as well. So you got to think a, a little bit about that. Um, but ultimately, once you harvest your fiber, uh, like we have here, you'll have a sickle bar mower, uh, kind of a, a chop and uh, drop scenario, and then you'll go through a redding cycle. And now uh, retting in Florida is another uh, one of those major challenges because you want to ret, you don't want to rot, uh, right? And so with the uh, retting, you kind of want somewhere between two to four weeks of dry retting. So leave the stems out in the field uh, so that the uh, out external fibers can, can fall away uh, from the her herd, uh, those, those um the external fibers and the and the internal fibers. There are ways to do this, uh, having uh, kind of collected a cro uh, crop. Uh, maybe uh, there's some um, um, large um, wet uh, redding uh, infrastructure available where you can take your crop off the field, you can stick it in a pond, uh, you can leave it there for a few weeks, similar uh, situation where uh, the plant slowly decays, uh, but in the way uh, that allows the, the uh, stem uh, to, to break off into two pieces. So once you're able to do that, that redding, uh, then you have to take it to a mechanical process. So uh, we just, uh, this formation ag uh, unit is one, uh, that we just uh, uh, acquired uh, for the UF hemp program. Uh, this is also a, a herd master, a couple uh, available on the market. There, there's all sorts of uh, engineering savvy folks uh, that have been able to uh, acquire or, or build uh, some of these uh, themselves uh, as well. 
Um, and so what you're doing is you're taking this redded crop uh, and you're passing it through a uh, decorticator uh, such as uh, uh, Steve uh, Edmonds uh, has uh, as well. Uh, and what that is doing is, is sort of um, breaking the, here, let me, let me show you with, if you can see here. Okay, so this is one of my stems. Um, and so uh, if you can see my picture, uh, then you can see these areas, uh, the bast fiber that's separating from the herd and a decorticator is gonna kind of crimp it in, in a bunch of different ways, uh, mechanically and, and, and much faster than I can do with my hand. Uh, but that crimping then sort of pulls the bast away from the herd, uh, drops the herd in one spot and, and uh, the, the, the bast in another. Um, so, kind of a overly simplistic description of the timing, redding and decortication for, for fiber. Um, but in order to do this at scale, in order to do this to get uh, a return on, on your investment, um, we're talking uh, bales and bales of this um, with uh, these individual um, uh, decorticators that I mentioned sort of get uh, over overwhelmed very quickly. So I've seen a lot of these units being uh, tried uh, around Florida, like, hey, I got good fiber, it, it can be decorticated. Um, decortication efficiency uh, is uh, an aspect of, of hemp uh, varieties uh, that folks are tracking. Um, but uh, otherwise, then you're selling your bast or your herd uh, into a separate uh, stream. So I'm waiting on a large uh, processor to uh, finalize an investment in Florida and set up their uh, their operations so that we can start uh, sending material that way. Um, in this case, uh, it's probably an export uh, market or, or some sort of private uh, effort that you're looking at. So, um, uh, Steve, you, you've uh, added some comments here in the chat. Would you uh, like a moment to uh, say hi to folks and uh, add any thoughts you have about uh, fiber uh, harvest or, or processing? Sure. Um, you know, I mean, I've been I've been at this a bit. I've been watching this since uh, since we've been able to convince uh, uh, the folks in Tallahassee that this might be a good idea. Um, my my uh, reoccurring thing that I've said at just about every meeting since the beginning is we need infrastructure. You mentioned it briefly at the beginning. This is the infrastructure or part of the infrastructure. We need much more than this. But decortication is the is the the kind of the first baby steps that we need to do at a scale, you know, large scale. As as you mentioned, the machines you have pictured and the one that I have will not absolutely will not keep up uh, with anything uh, on a scale capacity. And if you don't have scale, you don't have a home. And if you don't have a home, you can't get the buyer, the farmers to, to agree to, to uh, grow the crops. This is a crop that will absolutely revitalize Florida agriculture. If, uh, if you guys will think about it in terms of not necessarily subsidies, but, you know, let's get some programs in place where we can get some, some low interest loans. Let's get some, some co-op and sharing opportunities between municipalities and, and counties and, and, and organizations. Let's uh, figure out how we can try and organize uh, farmers to build their own infrastructure so that we don't have to pay somebody else to, to, to take our crop. Uh, these are all things that are done at, 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 at mass levels for citrus and blueberries and sugar and for everybody else. There is absolutely no reason why Florida can't be the leader in industrial hemp production, not only for the country, but for the entire planet. Uh, we have seven different grow zones and we can grow every type of hemp in the state. We might have to supplement with some light as Zach pointed out, uh, but light with solar is fairly uh, accessible and acquirable. Um, but infrastructure and getting the bureaucracy to work with the politic politicians so that there is confidence in the market is what we need. And that's what we've been needing for, for since, since 2008. Uh, so yeah. thanks, Zach, for the opportunity. Sure. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate your candor and, and experience here. 
Um, and, and one of the things uh, that the researchers are uh, grappling with as we start uh, adding crop quality uh, into our research is a clear definition of what that means uh, in terms of uh, fiber quality. Uh, there are a copious number of other crops that uh, define uh, their, their uh, bale, their bushel, their uh, expected uh, specification. So, uh, of course, uh, the competitor here for fiber is, is cotton. And so the cotton uh, diameter of fibers and uh, the quality of those fibers, the uh, decortication, the uh, carding, the, all sorts of steps that go along, uh, degumming uh, is in between the decortication and, and carding, uh, you know, all of those things, uh, farmers, or uh, perhaps more uh, specifically, the interaction between farmers and the processing facility are going to have to begin to agree on, on what this means. And, and so as a research program in Florida, uh, I'll generally agree uh, with Steve. Uh, we've been able to show that these crops can grow in various parts of the state, uh, but figuring out whether or not they can grow with quality uh, do they have those specifications necessary uh, for uh, the supply chain? Uh, that's uh, uh, another uh, aspect to this. For a processing facility uh, at scale that I've seen in, in other states, uh, we're talking about the amount of fiber uh, that would grow across tens of thousands of acres. And that exactly. number kind of, yeah, Steve, jump in. Can I jump in? Do you mind? Um, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I mean, I've done the numbers on this a lot of times and we can take the crop that needs to go all the way to grain to seed so that so that people can get an idea of the full of the full rotation of the, you know, because that's your longest crop, basically. Right. So in order to produce enough seed to supply a small biodiesel facility, uh, one that would take all the seed it could find. Um, and, and one within a, a ideally a 200 uh, mile diameter around the, the facility. Um, in order to feed that facility that'll only produce 2.5 to 3.5 million gallons of fuel, ASTM certified biodiesel a year, you would need 10,000 acres turning one grain crop. Now, if you can get 5,000 acres to turn two, great, but you know, you need 10,000 acres to turn once in order to, in, in order to, to uh, be the feedstock for a facility that size. And, and when you're yeah. talking about in terms of industrial scale and size, you are talking about entry level industrial scale with that size facility. Right. It's not right. big. You know, it's not, it's not big. And, and, and you know, I say 10,000 acres turning once, everybody says, oh, that's a lot. That's not a lot. <laughs> that's not a lot in the comparison of, of, once we get going, I mean, to, to give you another example, in order to uh, uh, fuel the Georgia Pacific plant that would be able to produce toilet paper out of hemp, you would need nearly 300,000 acres turning once, uh, you know, and that's a fiber, that's a fiber term, but that's, that's a lot of acreage, but uh, we could do that in the state of Florida easily. We have that kind of acreage in the state of Florida. So, I mean, there's the potential for us is, is there. Thanks. Thanks for the interruption again, Zach. Yeah, sure. Uh, and uh, it's just kind of uh, the point you make about uh, the university or the state coming along and assisting with that. Uh, what uh, processing facility is going to agree to invest without guaranteed uh, farmers and what farmers are going to agree to produce uh, without guaranteed buyer? Uh, that's an overall summary of where we are uh, today. The uh, point you make about the fiber versus we'll get to seed production here with the uh, with the biofuels and, and things along that nature. 10,000 acres um, is is not a lot in the scheme of of commodity agriculture, uh, but an interesting comparison. Um, there are 10,000 acres of wild rice being produced in the Everglades region. Uh, so maybe you never knew that there was uh, rice being produced in the Everglades, but uh, that's sort of uh, an interesting uh, kind of comparison to make. Uh, they can do it with the wild rice. Uh, I think we have an opportunity to try and do it with uh, with the the cannabis. Okay. Um, any other comments or questions about the harvest 
and uh, kind of field uh, processing uh, for fiber. Uh, Mr. Gross, um, the fiber varieties, what yields are being achieved in Florida? Um, yes, I have seen research plots uh, that have made the uh, three tons uh, an acre. Um, we have uh, seen as much as five tons an acre in, in small, very small instances. Um, but uh, we're probably more kind of realistically as an expectation still a bit below that. Uh, with uh, production across the state, uh, you know, given the challenges with genetics and and field density and and things along those lines. So when I think about what can we accomplish or what I've seen overall accomplished with the research trials and the partnerships across the state, it's somewhere uh, around that two to four ton mark. Um, the varieties are the um, southern uh, Chinese uh, varieties. Uh, that uh, tend to have higher uh, calipers. So I mentioned a pencil-sized uh, uh, stem uh, for the hemp plant. Um, the Chinese genetics uh, make it to the three or four tons, um, but the diameter of those stems uh, can get as large as a quarter-sized, uh, you know, the coin. Um, so much larger than uh, what we'd be hoping for uh, for a bass fiber uh, production. So... Uh, the last thing I'll say is I think there's a valuable entry position for herd. Uh, we have all of those horse barns and and uh, construction uh, companies in, in Florida. And, and so if we're able to make an entry uh, into the industry there, uh, selling off the herd, it doesn't get as uh, much of a price for it. Uh, but if we can get the infrastructure, uh, the decortication, the sales, uh, then uh, we might be able to uh, use that as a, as a springboard for the industry. Uh, I'll uh, just uh, allow one more moment uh, for questions about fiber. The last thing that I'll say about fiber uh, might open a much broader uh, discussion, um, but in thinking about hemp plantings for conservation, uh, as uh, many of the projects that I'm uh, looking to be involved with in the next couple of years, there could be a value to using conservation tillage or no tillage. Uh, there could be value to just producing biomass uh, and being uh, kind of uh, uh, compromising in the way that we pull the biomass uh, from the field, uh, how we manage our fields. Uh, and so those sorts of premiums that might come along with carbon sequestration uh, or locking up carbon in the hemp biomass uh, is something that I'm paying attention to, uh, per, per, you know, selfishly for my interest in agroecology, uh, but also as an opportunity to help elevate this industry out of the, uh, out of the gates. Okay, so uh, jumping uh, into uh, the seed discussion here. So I mentioned that uh, in order to produce seeds, you need a monoecious plant, which is where there are male flowers and female flowers separately on the same plant, or uh, dioecious uh, crops, which is separate plants, males and females. About two weeks uh, before females flowers, the males flower, uh, they distribute pollen in a copious uh, uh, quantity uh, around the same time that those female flowers are beginning to develop, uh, and that pollen needs to transfer from one plant to the other. Um, these seeds are from a whole bunch of different varieties, and so you can see the various different sizes. Of course, as you get closer to lentil size, uh, you start seeing more uh, interest in, in sort of that uh, hemp for, for hold uh, hemp seeds. Uh, you can press uh, those as well. Uh, again, it's a surface area to volume thing, right? You want less uh, hull and uh, more uh, seed. And, and in so doing, uh, we're able to uh, kind of develop uh, that uh, industry. Uh, notwithstanding, seeds for, for multiplication, uh, having a stable seed from Florida for Florida uh, that can be distributed to farmers, either for a fiber crop or a, another seed crop. Uh, that's an in, important part here. As we start talking about seeds, I want to make sure that I remind everybody that hemp is an indeterminate crop. What does that mean? That means that the uh, plant flowers 
and continues to grow at the same time. So once the flowers start, you're going to see those at the bottom of the plant, and they're going to mature at the same time as new flowers are going to start higher up in the plant. And so you're going to get more established flowers uh, and seeds uh, in the bottom of the plant, and, and then uh, fewer uh, towards the top. So it makes it very interesting to describe harvest timing. So when do you decide when to harvest seed? Okay, so the way that we do it from a research perspective is similar uh, to others we've seen in the industry. We basically cut that in half, right? We say that when half of the seeds are hardened, uh, then uh, it's time to begin uh, harvesting. Uh, now, of course, it's half of the seeds on a plant and then half of the plants in the field. That gets to be uh, a really uh, intuitive, uh, sort of uh, can be a game uh, day decision. Um, another issue with that uh, variable maturity in the same plant is that hemp is still very much at risk for shattering. So what does that mean? Once those seeds from the bottom of the plant begin to produce uh, mature seeds, those seeds are going to start falling off of the plant. Okay, um, and so uh, therein lies again uh, the challenge. A farmer is going to want to harvest when they can maximize their load of seeds. So that sort of goes without saying, uh, but uh, the point is it's a lot harder to do in practice uh, than it is uh, in, uh, in, in the theory uh, here. And, and so uh, this system here uh, is a combine. Uh, they're uh, rolling the uh, seed heads uh, off the top of these plants uh, and tossing them uh, into uh, that uh, wagon over there. Now, I didn't get to this at the sickle bar mower uh, because that's a pretty straightforward cut. Uh, you can calibrate your, your mower to the height. That makes sense. Now, early days in the hemp industry, when folks were talking about mowing and, and combining uh, hemp plants, there was all sorts of reports that came along with that of tractors lighting on fire in the field. Okay, why might that happen? Well, these plants tend to be fibrous and they tend to be resinous. And if you don't have your calibration set, if you haven't uh, sort of made sure uh, that your combine system is uh, robust enough to the hemp, then the hemp sort of gets uh, blocked up into the combines. Those things start uh, adding uh, heat uh, into the system and then uh, the fibers kind of go up. Um, so uh, just sign of some things that uh, come to mind uh, for me uh, that I wanted to share uh, related to uh, seed harvest. We have not been able to do this with a combine out of the UF uh, research projects yet. Uh, we've been basically doing a similar uh, chop uh, to the uh, fiber uh, plants, and then we're drying them uh, in a, an oven. Um, and the uh, thresher that you see here, this Almeco uh, sp small uh, bundle thresher, uh, we have one of those and, and we have a uh, secondary uh, unit um, as well, just their, their uh, BT14 uh, thresher. Um, and so this is what we're using uh, in replace of a combine. And, and so again, it's another uh, area where the industry is going to have to grow to scale, where instead of just making do with a, a handheld uh, thresher uh, to knock the seeds uh, off the, the plant and remove the, uh, the leaves, uh, that uh, kind of we're able to do that at scale. The cleaning is an important step, uh, particularly for uh, for, for sales uh, and, and, and for measurements. Uh, so that's where you go through uh, thresher a couple times. Uh, you get those leaves and the rocks and the things like that uh, removed from the seeds. I did want to mention something about drying. Um, it's still unclear what the industry expects for uh, dry seed uh, and the weight that you would uh, calibrate uh, seed. Uh, Sales around, uh, I'm hearing uh, numbers about 8%. So the, the research uh, group uh, out, of, out, of the, out of the US that I'm working with has kind of come together to agree uh, that that 8% moisture uh, matches other grain crops, uh, particularly with the safety for uh, pests and pathogens in the seed loads, and uh, then uh, also uh, kind of uh, helps us uh, harmonize uh, our, our harvest weights. 
So that's the uh, discussion that I have for seeds. Uh, as Steve had, had mentioned that one of the outlets for the, Steve, uh, for the seeds could be uh, the biofuels. Uh, I mentioned the hold uh, hemp seed. Uh, you can also press uh, the seed both with holes and, and not the holes. Uh, that gives you a, an oil uh, that has a relatively high and favorable ratio of, of fatty acids. Uh, you can also extract the protein uh, out of uh, those, uh, the mash. Um, that those seed cakes that comes after um, you get the oil and then you get what's left. Folks tend to call those uh, seed cakes. Uh, those have been considered for consumption uh, in animal feed uh, and, and a whole sorts of, of other things. So um, seeds, uh, as necessary as they are for um, for planting, are also a, a viable industry uh, themselves. Any uh, comments or, or questions uh, from, from the group here? So as far as acreage goes, I see seed as a little bit less of a entry level acreage for, um, for fiber. Uh, uh, Victory Foods, uh, for example, is a company that uh, has uh, been growing uh, and processing uh, hemp uh, seed. Uh, they were able to kind of saturate their um, their facility, for, from my recollection, at about uh, three thousand to five thousand acres. Um, and so uh, there's there's a, an opportunity there. Uh, again, uh, out of our research, we want to be moving into crop quality metrics, uh, having a better understanding of what that means, what the expected outlet from the um, the Florida industry is going to be is going to be critical for our um, for for the industry in the state. Uh, Sam, thank you for your question. Uh, thinking of multiple harvests per year, is there frost tolerance uh, for the hemp gene pool? So there is some tolerance. Uh, I have, um, yeah, that, all right. Thanks, Bob. Uh, responding with, uh, it can survive one day, but, but not a week of frost. Um, that sounds about right. Uh, from folks in the northern latitudes, I've heard of crops that have been snowed on. Uh, and then uh, been able to get out of the snow uh, over the course of a couple days uh, into the season. Uh, I don't have experience on the other side. So what happens if there's a frost as seeds are setting, uh, or, or I would expect a frost to uh, turn back uh, the flowers as well. Um, so if we're getting into uh, the uh, freeze, uh, then uh, you're probably uh, looking to harvest ahead of time. The um the discussion of multiple crops a year is one that i have hesitance uh wrapping my head around uh let's say primarily because of the flowering time uh expectations of these plants um, so you might get a second crop in the winter, if you will, but they're going to be much smaller and they're going to be much faster to turn around, if viable at all. Um, and so that's where relying on some of the uh, day neutral genetics uh, that might be coming from um, the north. Uh, then, uh, you know, again, it's just uh, how many different cogs uh, do we need to line up? Uh, for our, our industry here, uh, we might have the day neutral genetics uh, that uh, would perform in the winter, uh, but don't necessarily uh, put on the, the grain loads or, or have the ability to, um, uh, to respond effectively to our pests and diseases. So light supplementation is something that you could do. You could put up the stadium lights uh, around your field. Uh, hemp, uh, uh, that graphic uh, prior that I showed about when hemp is flowering, it matches about civil twilight. So that is an exceedingly small amount of light, like 2.5 uh, micromoles of photons of light per meter. It, it's it, it's a, it's something you can barely uh, detect with your own eyes. Um, and so having a couple LED stadium lights can do it. Um, I've also seen those stadium lights uh, come along and uh, attract all the bugs that you don't want on your, your crop or the birds and things like that. 
Um, so I also haven't seen that done at scale. I've seen it done in uh, in research plots. I, I've seen the effects of the um, kind of the light and its shadow or, or the distribution of light. Um, if you want to do a winter crop, you're probably going to have to add light or find a day neutral genetic uh, that's that's working for you. Um, some of the some of the northern seed producers out of Canada, out of northern Europe, actually are also day neutral for a different reason, right? So I'm saying day neutral here in in Florida is necessary because our days don't ever get long enough. The folks in the farthest farthest reaches of of hemp uh, distribution, uh, Canada and such. Um, they have day neutral genetics uh, because their growing season isn't isn't long enough. Uh, and so they have the 90 days they have to get the full crop in in, in that amount of time. Um, I haven't uh, had access to those genetics like Fanola um, in our in our trials uh, just yet. Okay. Um, any other questions about about seeds? I sort of had a related question maybe. Sure, Mickey, go ahead. Um, and I started to put it in the chat box and then thought maybe not. Do we need to be thinking about crop insurance for this? Is there any chance this crop will be covered by crop insurance? Because it sounds like that would be important. And it also <laughs> sounds like facilities insurance would be important. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, and that um... would be something Farm Bureau would really be, need to be on board for. So I think some protective features there would be kind of important. Yeah, absolutely. Some of the, uh, the the current available crop insurance for Florida hemp farmers is a uh, whole farm or multi uh, crop insurance. Uh, so hemp hasn't found its way into the system as an individual crop uh, in Florida. I think it takes uh, three commercial years of, of the um, uh, whomever it is that calculates the insurance rates and all of those things, uh, they need a certain number of years in order to make that calculation. So Florida is just on the cusp of that. Uh, we might expect news of a uh, Florida hemp uh, uh, crop insurance uh, option. Uh, and when someone does, please uh, let me know. Um, otherwise, uh, what's available is uh, uh, sort of a uh, is that is that whole farm farm option. So. Um, yeah, Mickey, you're, you're very attuned to kind of what farmers are going to need in order to protect the risk and, uh, and, and get into the adoption phase. Um, you've spent the summer listening to me uh, say all the reasons we have against us. Uh, insurance uh, would certainly help uh, get some folks uh, a try at this. Thank you. Okay, I, I saved the right. Okay, uh, yeah, Bob, thanks. Um, uh, uh, candid point is as usual. Um, in order to get that data, folks need to be making the sales, um, and uh, so uh, this is that uncomfortable uh, period uh, that we've been in for a couple decades uh, with. Uh, uh, farmers uh, ready to go, uh, but lacking the uh, mobility. Uh, or the resources to do so. So I left flower to the end. I, I thought about doing it at the beginning. Um, this is really uh, not necessarily folks on the call uh, today, uh, but when I do my surveys of hemp farmers in Florida, uh, flour uh, for uh, fresh market or flour for processing uh, tends to be the uh, market uh, that is kind of driving uh, the ship right now. Um, so just to summarize some of the numbers uh, that we have from the state uh, from last year, uh, 72 acres approved for harvest in 2022 in Florida. Uh, among those uh, 72 acres, there were just short of 400 harvests. So harvests are being logged at a much smaller area than an acre. Uh, so I expect most of these approved harvests to be uh, indoors or some sort of controlled environment, uh, and the surveys uh, sort of uh, reflect uh, that they're uh, flower for um, uh, for 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 direct sales for 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 fresh market. Um, 
Now that said, there's a very interesting number that I'm also chewing on, which is the uh, value of that 35,000 pounds of flour in 2022 amounted to $5 million. When I do that math, that's the price that we are getting out of flour in 2018 and 2019. And that's not my my expectation for a price today at 50 cents to a uh, dollar a pound. Um, but anyways, that's the information that I have available uh, to me. Um, and I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Casuso for her help along the way, uh, uh, reporting and recording uh, the the harvests um, and uh, matching that up with those quick stats from uh, USDA uh, is something we'll be uh, diving into uh, later on in the year. So so flour. Uh, if you're making a run at uh, hemp in Florida and you have a chance to uh, make a return on investment, uh, it's probably with flour. Uh, I sort of hinted earlier that as an agronomist, as uh, someone in agroecology, I, I'd like to see the fiber and the, the seed production uh, go along uh, to, to motivate uh, that part of the industry. Um, but uh, here we are today, 2023, uh, hemp in Florida is uh, flour production. Um, so uh, this uh, becomes a, a critical distinction for uh, harvest timing. Uh, and so folks are fond of saying, well, of course, you got to harvest at the right time. That's 0.3% Delta 9 uh, THC, uh, less than 0.3% and no greater than 30 days uh, prior to uh, harvest. Um, uh, some folks are, are going after uh, total cannabinoids, uh, others are going after uh, kind of flavonoid and terpene profile. I don't really get what folks will be uh, smoking it for, uh, you know, uh, given uh, the lack of uh, psychotropic uh, effects from the primary uh, CBD or, or CBG. Um, but uh, perhaps uh, there's other things going on, uh, certainly anecdotally, um, uh, and, and certainly from a market, uh, people are, are using this product. Um, and so you want to develop unpollinated flowers. Um, the uh, distinction between a seed crop where there is pollen and a flower crop where there isn't pollen uh, is something we've talked about uh, in previous meetings. Um, the uh, team here uh, at uh, Homestead, uh, this is kind of the um, crops that, that we've been able to produce uh, over uh, the, the last uh, few years, and, and then a, a, a bucket of uh, what is um, sort of uh, bucked and shucked uh, flour. And so the point about uh, harvesting, I mentioned fiber and seed, those are mechanically harvest. Uh, there might be an opportunity to mechanically harvest some of the flower crops, but by and large, uh, this is a labor requirement. Um, and so uh, you're cutting the plant at the stem, you're turning it upside down or tossing it into a dryer, uh, and then you're going to uh, uh, take the leaves and the flowers uh, off the stem, uh, that's the bucking, and then uh, pulling out the um, uh, leaves uh, from uh, the flowers, uh, that's sort of the uh, additional uh, clean step. So uh, about 12% moisture uh, is what the uh, industry and, and research uh, groups are, are coming along to accept. Um, so as our team uh, moves on with uh, calculating uh, standard uh, harvests, uh, we'll be uh, choosing that 12% uh, moisture as well. Uh, brings down the bioactivity um, and, uh, and, and also maintains some moisture for quality. Uh, how many acres of fiber were grown in Florida in uh, the previous years? Um, Sebastian, uh, I, I don't have a good answer for that. I don't think it's a whole lot. I mean, maybe 20 or 30, uh, but I don't know if it, they're not necessarily showing up in the uh, acres approved for harvest. Um, so this is a kind of a, a, a black box for me. It's a answer that I uh, send out for surveys um, and try to capture that information uh, in that way, um, but but not much, because uh, just like Steve says, uh, I'm not going to put out 100 acres if I can't sell any of it. Uh, and so uh, right now, what I get the sense of is folks that are interested in fiber are growing out uh, some sort of experimental lots, doing it small, calibrating their equipment, going, yeah, I could do this. And then uh, waiting for um, 
uh, the uh, kind of the processing uh, to open up. Oh, uh, that's an interesting point, Steve. Uh, and uh, some of that uh, continues from the 2019-2020. So commercialization for flour production uh, really kicked off uh, following the 2018 Farm Bill. And we saw 100 to 200,000 acres of hemp grown across the country. And then a vastly large quantity of that that was stored waiting for the good price. And then the pandemic hit and a number of the big processing facilities uh, went out of business. Uh, and so it's just kind of, it's taken till about this year, maybe even a bit past this year for, for that glut from 2019 uh, to pass through. When the economists are doing the sort of calculations like this is how much CBD people use, this is how many people use CBD, this is how much you need to grow in order to fill those uh, CBD uh, orders, they're estimating somewhere between 14 and 30,000 acres for the entire country, okay? And in, and in 2019, the United States grew more than 100,000 uh, acres of, of flowers. So um, uh, interesting question. Um, and uh, an important uh, kind of aspect to this. Uh, okay, and that's another way of, yeah. So folks are seeing that the market is uh, is sitting in flower. So uh, they're running out the, the flower market, seeing if they can hit uh, on a buyer there, um, but would actually prefer to uh, grow for flowers. Is that what you were trying to say, Steve? Yeah, okay. Um, any other questions for, for flower here? Okay. Um, so I just wanted to open this part up for, for discussion from the group. Um, I get a sense, um, you know, that folks are here uh, trying to uh, understand uh, where the industry is going, um, looking to, uh, you know, better get a better sense of, of where we're going. I, I'm curious. Uh, okay, Steve, you had a chance to talk a couple times. So others from the the meeting, like I've got hemp and nobody to sell it to, or I've been able to figure this out. I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, you know, this is the value of of these discussions. Um, you know, if if we could have done this uh, in person and get folks in on the roundtable type of deal, I would have done that. Um, but, uh, you know, anybody else on the call, uh, willing to share your story, uh, what your experience has been growing hemp this year or in the past, uh, kind of what's your strategy been, uh, for, uh, making this, uh, a, a marketable crop. Anybody out there? Sure, Bob, go ahead. You'll have to unmute. Unmute, okay, hear me now? Sure can. Yeah, we, we've grown uh, 20 crops, no, we've grown uh, 11 crops of fiber hemp since 2020. And we've experienced a lot of the various difficulties I would tell you that you can get fiber in the spring, but you're going to get grain in the fall mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. with your photo period work. You'll want to uh, get in the ground after the spring equinox for your fiber work, and you want to be out of the field by the rainy season because it just plays hell. You, you can't get a seed started again in the summer. Um, with all the water and drowning and, and all the work, it'll wash your seed away and all the weeds mm -hmm. come up. A very serious weed in Florida is, is nut sedge. Oh, yeah. Nut sedge is very vigorous in August and it will just smother your hemp crop. So if you've got, <clears throat> if you've got nut sedge coming up, it's a rhizome and if you're tilling up the soil for your seed crop, 
all you're doing is cutting that rhizome into five pieces and now you get five nuts edge for every one you had <laughs> so you end up with a great crop of nuts edge and no hemp in in the summertime yeah. we were just uh, introduced to sedge hammer for our uh, our our gardens our garden beds uh there's a targeted herbicide uh for the nuts edge um you get it you know get it out before your hemp but it's not labeled for hemp yeah, uh, we, bob we, you said 20 crops so you uh, mean 10, like 11 crops yeah um, so you're trying different varieties, you're moving them around into different places. I'm just curious how your math adds up. Well, we, we've always used the uh, the Yuma Puma uh -huh. material that you had. You showed that in your slide. And yeah. it's a very healthy fiber species. It has, uh, we've had no disease problems, no pest problems, no bugs. Um but we, we've been struggling with trying to get the crop density to the level that we need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did so. managed to get one crop up to five tons an acre. Okay. So, so we at a we, at we what scale? At a half acre? At an acre? What were you able to plant mm -hmm. that at? Well, those are small test plots. We just have to yeah. extrapolate okay. that material, so uh -huh. it's hard to say. But um, we have two kinds of harvesters. We have a a particle harvester that we take for paper and we have a four bar cutter that we use for uh, longer fiber and um, we can water ret that and get fiber out of it we can card that up and and make paper out of it so we cottonize the fiber and we are making paper out of it in, in test quantities and so forth so we're learning. So all you've the kind of work. vertically integrated your fiber processing, or it's all part of the the work that you folks are doing together. You pretty much have to go from farm to customer to to be any profit in it for yourself. There, there there's no way you can use third parties for anything. You just can't okay. afford the margin. It, it, well, I'm. Glad to hear you're still up to it, Bob. I'll uh, send you a note. Maybe we can uh, uh, get a couple of your uh, materials to uh, show uh, folks uh, here through through UF. So uh, you might have found a customer, at least for a couple of things. OK. Uh, anything else to add while, while the floor is yours? Well, we're, we're buying a processing facility in uh, Lake Wales. Uh, we close in October. And we'll be developing up our process. I've obtained a patent on a machine for processing our work so that we'll be building that up and continuing our test plots. Cool. So that's the um, work ahead for us. Great. And and so then to uh, reiterate a point I made earlier, uh, as your processing facility identifies what a uh, standard crop quality would be, or what's your sort of looking for from uh, uh, plant size, fiber size, uh, crop loads, things like that? I'll uh, certainly be interesting to uh, uh, to reference that with some of the uh, research uh, studies that we've been doing. So, yeah, well, we, we we grew a, a seed crop. Uh, well, we grew a crop planted in first of October, and it went to seed. But uh, we couldn't schedule the harvesting and the testing limits for only two weeks back then and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we just had to plow it in. And boy, it germinated real good. We got a real good crop of females in December, or January out of the thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had uh, that experience, too. So yeah. we got that's two right. crops back to back from October right there. Yeah. I wonder what it would be like if we could uh, get that January, February shoulder as, uh, as well. Um, just uh, been hard enough logistically uh, getting in a single season uh, with the research and all the processing of, of information. Um, I think this year uh, I'm going to be a little bit more earnest in, in doing that. Planting in November, seeing what happens. Uh, planting in February, seeing what happens. Um, probably uh, flowers too quick but we'll give it a try anyways well it depends on where you are in florida we're up in uh, lake wales on the ridge and uh, right you'll, you'll get too much frost in the winter time our, our plan essentially is to do fiber in the spring nitrogen in the summer 
and grain in the fall and nitrogen in the winter. You, you need nitrogen in the soil. The, the soil is pathetic. You're saying you'd put in like a cover crop uh, or add a compost in between uh, plantings? That's what you mean by nitrogen? Yeah, you've got to get something in there to build up the soil. The soil is yeah. just too pathetic. Um, a lot of the it's land kind of available to soil. us is former um, citrus grove. We have pictures of a grove um, that we planted, and you get yellow hemp where the citrus trees were, and you get green hemp where the grass was between the trees, and then you get yellow oh, hemp yeah. in the next row, and, a, and green hemp in the next row. So the the citrus trees have just exhausted the soil. There's nothing in there. And and yeah. there's probably a lot of chemical in there too. Okay. Um, thank you, Bob. Very much uh, appreciate it. Nice seeing you again. We'll catch mm -hmm. up again soon. Um, anybody else? Uh, I, I see a number of questions here. Yl, can you help me with these this group of questions? I think Sam uh, from FDAX was the last one, was the first of the batch. Yeah, any chance that the fiber and other discarded material stems, leaves, extra uh, from seed and flower operations could be sellable? Uh, well, I guess the argument or what we've been discussing today is that uh, we're hard pressed to describe anything but the flower to be sellable at this point. Um, at least from a market perspective, right? From the potential of the crop, certainly. Uh, that's one of the draws of this plant is that it is a, a multi-purpose uh, plant. Uh, there have been some companies that have bred for dual purpose. For example, a seed and CBD uh, producer is one of the genetics that we have in our, our trials. Um, so if you pull the flower early, uh, then you can sell some of that flower for CBD rich. Um, but if you let the seeds develop, then then you have uh, a high uh, uh, fatty acid, high protein uh, seed uh, to sell. Um, and then therein lies like, well, sure, you can pull off a flower crop and sell the fiber uh, and, and the multi multiple different ways that you can permutate that. It just becomes a scale and a quality uh, thing. Um, haven't seen the primary industry go forward where the fiber and the seeds are being sellable. Um, so it's hard to think of it as a uh, as a secondary or a, a byproduct at this point. All right, there's a question from Corey. Uh, any known processors for flower oil left in the state, or is it all being done privately by growers at this point? Uh, thanks for the question, Corey. Uh, this is one I tried to answer uh, prior to the meeting today, um, but I was a bit unsuccessful. Uh, my understanding uh, was prior to this year, there was the list available uh, of uh, food processors uh, and, uh, pr and, and, and product, um, processor. So this, there's a separate, um, what am I trying to say? So at FDAX, in order to be permitted to process hemp material, it is the food processors, food establishment, uh, license. Uh, Nicole, you want to jump in while well, I'm trying to answer it, or you want to let me try to answer it and then you can tell me what not. Um, uh, anyways, uh, there should be a list out there. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out how to, uh, access it and, and, and interpret it. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's good. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Uh, Zoom is kind of funky compared to Teams. Uh, but yes, so the list of permitted hemp food establishments, retailers, processors, et cetera, that is all regulated by the FDAX Division of Food Safety um, with a change of commissioner and just some reformatting of our public facing web pages. Some of that material is no longer uh, readily accessible, um, but I can leave at least the phone number and email address for that division. Uh, if anyone wants to follow up with them, I'm sure they'll still have those permitted entities in a list somewhere. Um, and you can reach out to them to contact. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. Um, we'll uh, we'll follow up about that. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I sort of uh, anecdotally, 
Um, I know of some folks uh, that have uh, contact. So Corey, if, if you have some material and you're looking for a um, uh, a buyer, uh, you can send me a note. I'll, I'll try to link you with at least within the folks that have told me they know and are willing to share their information. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, a couple uh, of the county extension agents at, at IFAS uh, and myself uh, will be going through uh, this list of processors um, to try to update that for 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 producers. So it's not such a uh, 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 smoke and mirror sort of situation uh, with with processors. That's um, awesome. Just to point Thank out, you. yeah, sure. Just to point out the the extra layer here. Uh, your second question is it being done privately by growers. It should not be unless they have a food establishment permit, right? So if you are a private grower and you are also processing your material, that would require you to have a, a, a permit from uh, plant industries, which is um, the producers, and then uh, uh, processors uh, from, from food safety. So, All right. There's a question from Marcus. Uh, anyone growing or uh, uh, doing... Um research and development on hemp flowers and pods? Um, Marcos, can you tell me a little bit more what you mean by, by pods? I see that you unmuted, but I don't hear you. So if you mean something like a soilless substrate, um, then uh, there is uh, certainly uh, effort across the board uh, to establish rooted cuttings uh, in those sorts of pods. Um, hydroponics uh, is, is definitely uh, something that we're seeing folks do, particularly with this controlled environment. Uh, not to, to, to beat around uh, the situation uh, any, uh, if you've heard it being tried or done, uh, in the uh, medical marijuana uh, space, then folks have probably tried it with the uh, hemp for, for flower uh, space. Um, and so it just uh, comes along with the additional cost for, for that infrastructure. Um, so, oh, um, so doing it indoor grow uh, in a shipping container or trailer, things like that. Yeah. Um, Again, it's just the different price that you can fetch for uh, CBD and the flower uh, versus what you'd get uh, in a uh, uh, medical marijuana uh, situation or recreational situation uh, just becomes one that you're trying to uh, to balance. So with the LED lights and, and a lot of the other advances, um, it's a bit outside of, of the work that I do uh, as agronomist, uh, but I've seen it, uh, heard of it being done successfully. Um, and Steve just responded and says uh, he has a client doing that. Okay. Yeah. So uh, there's one more question from Jean. Uh, is UF coordinating efforts to study hemp and KNF, uh, particularly relating to the viability of commercial scale sustainable fiber industry in Florida? Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, the question. Uh, just to uh, echo uh, what I'd said earlier with regards to um, the the fiber uh, production uh, in in that regard the the, the sustainability uh, for me uh, what that focuses on is the environmental and ecological sustainability uh, along with the production uh, of a farm uh, and so looking at some of those uh, carbon markets uh, conservation opportunities along with with hemp for fiber uh, I think given the inputs or the limited inputs for fiber um, has a better uh, chance to make those goals in contrast to flour, uh, to produce a strong flour uh, product, it's going to take nutrients, it's going to take uh, pesticides, uh, likely, uh, we're seeing a lot of fungus uh, issues, things like that. So I expect a lot of inputs to go with uh, the flour production, a lot of energy. Um, from the perspective of of like downstream uh, use. Uh, I, I won't uh, put Bob specifically on the spot today, uh, but one of the things uh, that's been very fascinating for me has been the idea that hemp insulation can actually be uh, carbon sink 
where once you develop the product and put it into uh, use, uh, then it's drawing carbon dioxide actively uh, out of the air. Uh, and so there's certainly opportunities for bio-based materials from hemp uh, to kind of uh, move into uh, those sorts of market opportunities. Now, the kind of extra layer there is right now the conservation programs that would pay a farmer for carbon doesn't allow offtake from the farm, right? The expectation is that you plant a tree, you leave the tree there for a hundred years, all of the carbon stays on your farm. That's what you're being paid for. So the market where you can bring carbon out of the air into your plant material and then sell it into a processing facility to make uh, insulation sort of uh, disentangles the sustainability on the farm from the sustainability of the, of the industrial application. Uh, you have to be thoughtful about the energy required for transportation and, and processing and all of that, um, but it's uh, an extra layer there, uh, something that I'm thinking very uh, deeply about um, with some, some curiosity and intent. Oh, uh, okay. So then um, as we develop this, uh, we'll call it a style of agriculture, right? A sustainability uh, focused, environmental, ecological, sustainably focused uh, farming, what I call agroecology. Um, the question sort of remains, is hemp the best choice? And so you pose hemp and canaf, um, Canaf uh, being a hibiscus uh, has some pest issues that are known in the state, has made it trouble to uh, grow at commercial scales, uh, nematodes, uh, and there's a, uh, um, uh, an invertebrate, um, like a weevil, uh, I think as well, um, uh, that uh, gets into the canaf. Uh, but the point being uh, that uh, hemp for a fiber crop, there are all sorts of other options as well. Uh, canaf, I mentioned sun hemp earlier, uh, that can be uh, another option as well. Um, and so the joke that I make is uh, cannabis uh, for me in agroecology has been a really great gateway crop because uh, then we get folks uh, sort of talking about these issues in, in uh, uh, industry development, processing, sustainability. Um, and so I really like the idea of sort of competing crops, hemp and canaf, uh, hemp, canaf, uh, sun hemp, uh, and uh, therein uh, lies uh, 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 an option, uh, but for that, that comparison. So thank you for the question. Oh, okay. There you go. Um, so, uh, canaf as a as a crop has a specific uh, extra layer of um, of permitting as as well. So, um, that's in the in the chat now. Okay, so I see a couple questions in the chat that are more aimed at our uh, our, our friends uh, at FDAC. So if you you're willing to uh, uh, hazard uh, an answer uh, there, uh, thank you very much for being here and sharing the floor uh, with our our interested participants. Uh, so yeah, I guess I could have left uh, this uh, slide up for our, our discussion. Um, how about your hemp market? I, I think what we've heard from at least two uh, producers uh, here in the call is, uh, you know, yeah, what about hemp market? Um, these folks have been around uh, a while, uh, certainly know how to grow this crop. Uh, if there was a market available, uh, these fellows would know uh, the market that is available and you hear them uh, talking uh, about uh, the markets that they've kind of had to generate uh, for themselves. Uh, and, and so just kind of be clear headed about that. Um, we're still in a this plant can grow well in the state, but um, and so be very cautious uh, about uh, the extent that you do this. I uh, am very much looking forward to the next few years uh, as a number of these processing facilities uh, that have been describing their intents um, to, uh, to, 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 to invest and scale and develop. Um, and so stay tuned. Um, that's got to be a critical uh, piece of information that comes out of the extension program uh, here at, at UF. Um, so uh, that's the extent of, of my discussion today. Um, again, thank you to the folks uh, that, with, that interacted, asking questions. I, I found the questions very thoughtful and, and helpful uh, to our discussion. 
Um, are there other burning questions about our discussion today or uh, other things uh, related to uh, hemp production and, and processing? I'm just going to remind you, Zach, that that uh, hemp for water could, uh, could grow an awful lot of fiber and, and nitrogen uh, uh, rich water and clean up the water at the same time. Um, if you want to explore something, let's explore something. All right. Cool. We have uh, been uh, talking to the fish uh, farm down the road as well, trying to see if uh, we can make something out of their uh, their waste products. Uh, Marcos, uh, thanks for your question about program visits. Uh, we are kind of in uh, the middle of a, a couple intensive years, um, so we're a bit quiet about visits. Um, but depending on what part of the state you're at, if, if you'd like to reach out to me, um, we do have a, a couple trials uh, around the state going on, uh, primarily uh, nutrient management trials. We're focusing on nitrogen and, and phosphorus. Um, uh, and uh, if, you, if you'd like to see uh, something going on, you're, you're, you're welcome if we can schedule a visit. Um, so uh, Dr. Casuso uh, mentions uh, that uh, the door is open. Uh, for uh, hemp uh, labs uh, that uh, might be uh, available to um, uh, be a resource for 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 producers. Um, so we went from uh, six, I think, to two. So uh, definitely an interesting observation to make uh, about the the support, the allies uh, to support this industry. So um, uh, just to, to mention, uh, if you like to grab this QR code, uh, I'm sure most folks are familiar with uh, where we're keeping our information uh, at this uh, website. Uh, where That's where we're keeping these recordings and, and updating. Uh, my main task for this fall is developing a uh, producer's guide uh, for 2024. Okay, so I just told you that it'd be tough to make a market, um, but we're still putting out that information for how to grow this crop. Uh, that's been my uh, perspective over the last couple of years. So when that opportunity comes along and the market develops, uh, that we've got the information available uh, for, for you folks. Um, uh, of course, uh, fdax.gov slash hemp, that's uh, the website you'll need for the licensing um, and uh, additional information about uh, approval for harvest. And then that's me. So thank you, everybody. I uh, appreciate you joining us today. Um, we'll be having a, uh, another meeting uh, in a couple months, really just kind of providing an overview of uh, our work at UF and, and the interactions we've had with uh, producers over the year. Um, thank you for your feedback and your participation and uh, looking forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thanks for putting it on, Zach. Thanks, Steve. We'll catch up soon. Hold on, I'm getting the chats. Don't shut it down yet. <laughs> That's fine. There should be a ellipse at the bottom of your chat window. You can just save the whole thing. What? Make that easy. All right. Where's it saved to? Uh, like your downloads folder. Wonderful technology. <laughs> All right, everybody. I'm going to uh, close the meeting. Have a good Thank day. Thank you, Zach.